Chiaveev, Kimara Hashiv. I'm a Kotol Chiaveev show, Ek Nagaman and Geoloch and in Fergus. Hello, uh, I'm Michael Newton, and I'm very happy to be a part of the 75th anniversary Fergus Scottish Festival. Hi, I'm Linda Heathfield, a longtime volunteer at the Fergus Scottish Festival. Not the whole 75 years, but long enough to know that we have a really special guest lined up, one of the preeminent scholars in all things Scottish, the Gaelic language, culture, traditions, history, and that's Dr. Michael Newton. Michael, thank you so much for joining us virtually as we celebrate our 75th this year. Thanks, it's great to be with you. <clears throat> okay, and I will probably say several times in this interview that I am a unilingual English Canadian. So uh, this has been quite edifying for me to read uh, your books. Now you've written a number of them, uh, but I'd like to focus on two of them. I think they're your most recent ones. Uh, this one really caught my eye. I'll see if I can show it on our crazy screen. And that is, a handy little guide to the Fergus Scottish Festival for all of our festival goers when we go live next year. And that's the naughty little book of Gaelic, all the Scottish Gaelic you need, curse, swear, drink, smoke, and fool around. I think our campers need this book. Uh, but actually, uh, all levity aside, it is quite interesting uh, to sort of compare my English cuss words with the very colorful words that you describe and use in this book. I'm, I wonder if you have a theory as to why uh, the Scots don't focus on body functions like the English do in their invectives. Right, well, this is really specific to Scottish Gaelic. So the Highlanders would, be, would see the Lowlanders as being very alien from them and more like the English than they are. So with the Highlanders, they're very similar to many Scandinavian countries, where in order to express strong feelings or anger at somebody, you, you talk about bodily functions, well, defecation in particular, or you talk about bad weather, or you talk about the devil. Uh, you know, the act of sexual intercourse is not a bad, evil thing in itself, like it is in English, for example. Okay. We're getting there, we're getting the, to the, the meat right away, aren't we? Well, you know, it's hard to avoid it in this uh, little book. Uh, lots of meat. <laughs> uh, do you have a theory as to why, I mean, in popular culture, we view the Scots, you know, as a bit of a cliche, as hardworking, industrious, rather dour people. Um, this is not the phraseology of dour people. It's, it's colorful and invective. Um, do you have an explanation for that? Well, part of what you're talking about is the, the kind of stereotypes that, were, that really describe the urban lowlanders rather than, than highlanders. So oh. of course the highlanders uh, were and are a very rural people who did not have shame around their bodies. The, the, the whole Protestant uh, morality thing was very late in coming to the Highlands. So those kinds of stereotypes that we have based on the Anglophone world just don't really work when you're really looking at uh, Gallic, uh, Ga Scottish Gallic culture and values and worldview. This is the most recent book and unfortunately, oh look, it does show on our crazy background. It's Gaelic in your gob, four dozen English words that come from the Scottish Highlands. Now, there's scores of words in here, and I've sort of selected a few of them that really piqued my interest. Uh, and it makes sense that neighbors, uh, the Highlanders and the English, perhaps via the Lowlands, uh, would have language going back and forth. Uh, and perhaps it makes sense most in words that we think of Scotland, us English speakers. And I'm wondering if you can talk to us about the word clan, uh, how it evolved and whether it means different things on this side of the Atlantic, uh, especially in current history. Right, well, this is uh, one of many words that are interesting because they kind of go between languages and different language groups and communities. 
And one of the interesting things about the word is that it was a very early borrowing from Latin into, I believe, Brythonic, and then from Brythonic, the language of the ancient Welsh, for example, okay. uh, that then went into, into Gaelic and then, you know, was widespread in Gaelic in both Scotland and Ireland. And it means children. And oh. this was a word that was used to in about the 12th through 14th centuries to talk about the descendants of people, you know, all the descendants who were born from a particular ancestor. So this is why we have terms like Clan Donald, Clan Campbell, and so on. Now, by about the 16th century, that term was no longer being used to describe a clan, Gallic started using the term kinyuk. So it, it switched, but it kind of got fossilized in English, mm -hmm. this term clan. It got borrowed because of, because of the use to talk about these family units um, in the highlands. It got borrowed then into English. And because a kin-based society was dominant in the highlands and yet in the lowlands and in England, it had become kind of obsoleted by other social forms or other social structures, then people in English continue to use the word clan to talk about kin-based societies. So even when they were talking about other countries overseas, like for example, Native America, First Nations, um, other societies, ancient Rome and so on, they, were, they would use the, the Gallic term clan because it was the perception was there wasn't a term anymore in English that corresponded to that concept. So it's an interesting example of, of Gallic providing a word for a concept that became obsolete in English, but was still operating at the time in the Highlands. Okay. Now we um, celebrate four pillars of Scottish tradition and heritage at the Fergus Scottish Festival. So certainly clans are important to us. We have a huge clan gathering and uh, it's sort of a segue into the next word I've selected for you to explain. And it's a word that I didn't think was Scottish at all. I thought a beatnik invented it in the 60s and that's shindig. Tell hmm. me about how the word shindig evolved. Well, this is sort of a theory that I've pieced together from my, from, on my own based on bits of evidence and the fact that so many scholars say, we don't know where these words came from. The words uh, shindig and shindy, they both uh, sort of appear in North America in the early-ish 19th century to, talk, to, to describe a social gathering that could be kind of raucous, that typically has music and dancing and so on. Um, so how do we explain this word that just kind of suddenly appears in these two variants? Well, the, they seem to be related to the word shinti. And shinti is a, uh, a club and ball game, which you can find in Scotland, uh, probably, uh, certainly it was in parts of Northern England as well. And there are versions of this game in Ireland as well. In Ireland, uh, they call it something different, the term, oh, what is it? Hurling, call it okay. hurling in Ireland. Uh, these are all variants of the same basic game. You have a stick and, and you hit a ball. And of course, in Canada, that evolves to be hockey. Of course. So it's, it's certainly, you know, a major influence on what develops as hockey. Now, there's more than one ancestor for the game. And we don't want to claim exclusive ownership on its development from Gallic or from uh, Shinti, but certainly that's a major component of it. And um, so the term Shinti itself is a little bit odd. Uh, there were various terms that probably come from forms of Middle English, but they were influenced by the Gallic term Shinjek. And Shinjek means a hop or a jump or a skip or something like that, which is what the ball would do when you would hit it and make this, this big you know, skip. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the term Shinjek is used in Gallic for hop and skip for other things as well. So for, for, so for example, for dancing, you hop and skip and you dance. So the term sheen check was used to describe, 
to describe the 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 game uh, of of shinty that was kind of the the Gallic version of that term, but also for the movement of dancers and and, and other beings, animals, and people who would hop and skip. And because number one, uh, the game of shinty was a was a very big affair, and you'd have you know dozens of young men and probably older men as well coming together to play, and they would they would cause a big ruckus, ruckus and then uh, afterwards at night there would be a big party because you have all these people here who would play during the day, and so sometimes they'd have to travel a good distance to get to these matches. And so people would be staying the night. And if you're staying the night, you might as well stay up and, and sing and dance and drink. And so the term shindig and shindi seemed, seemed to be kind of this, this set of associations around the events of a ball match of when people would get together to play these games. Okay. And uh, I guess the, the dancing is another form of hopping too. That's and right. We do a fair bit of that at the Fergus Scottish Festival. And that leads me in a very indirect way to the next word, which is trues. And I guess my knowledge of the word trues or trousers comes from, uh, well, Braveheart, uh, the nobleman donning his kilt and hopping on the horse to go conquer the English. And uh, the dancers, hundreds of years later, uh, losing the dreaded trousers gaining the freedom of the beloved kilt. Only I think that's maybe a bit of a romantic fiction I have in my head. So correct me about trues and trousers, please. Right, so truus, truus is a very old Gallic world, uh, word that you could find in both uh, Irish uh, Gallic and Scottish Gallic. And th these are the tight fitting trousers that start at the hip and, and go down to the ankle. And uh, now imagine for a moment, uh, I don't know if you, do you ride horses at all? So, Not at all. <laughs> well, what would it be like if you were wearing a, a, a skirt and you wore, uh, you were riding a horse? Would that be comfortable? No, and side but, saddle would be worse, I would think. It would but... not be comfortable. And it would be certainly very uncomfortable for a male, given these kind of equipment that men are born with. So that's the reason that trues were available and made for kind of the highborn men, because it was the highborn men who had horses, who went horseback riding. And when you ride a horse, you want something to protect your, your male packages, right? So kilts do not cut it. So there have always been trues, and the kilt developed later on probably in about the 15th or 16th century is when the kilt evolved from an earlier garment. Uh, but the trues have always been around. And this idea, so later on, of course, you have in the 18th century, the development, the beginning of Highland dance. And then in the 19th century, it became very romanticized and people started making up stories to make it seem like the dances were older. And they made up the story about, you know, the, the trues being shed that's a that's a made up story from the 19th century. I'm afraid there's there's no actual historical accuracy to that at all. That's so the truths have coexisted with the kilt, uh, and the truths are actually older than the kilt. Okay, and is there a class distinction between truths and kilt? Well, truths uh, when you think about sewing, um, a kilt is just a long piece of piece of cloth that you can fold up and then put on. Yes. If you want to have a nice piece of trues, that that uh, requires a great deal of, of cloth and of expertise to make that fitted well. And again, as I say, uh, it was suitable for 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 uh, for riding horses, and only the wealthy could have could afford to buy horses. So the trues are associated with upper upper class men. Okay. Now another thing I associate with the upper class, the aristocracy, um, is the tradition of the noble drink of uh, whiskey and all of the 
fine traditions of language of tasting and uh, all done by the aristocracy and the landed gentry. Only it's another place that I'm wrong, evidently, by your your giggles there. Uh, tell me what I'm wrong about. Well, first of all, yes, the, the word whiskey is a borrowing from Gaelic, from Scottish Gaelic, Ushkebeha. And this is a fairly early a borrowing, probably, I, I have it in the book, I can't quite remember, but I, I think it starts to be borrowed into Lowland Scots in about the 16th century, I think. The, the, the details are there. Um, but the funny thing is, uh, so you're, you're a Highland aristocrat. Mm -hmm. And what is your, your preferred drink? It is not whiskey. That's kind of for the lower downs. Your preferred drink is, is the wine that you trade to get from, from France and Spain. That is the preferred drink, is this beautiful red wine that you're getting from your import-export market. And so remember the Highlanders continued these connections with um, Spain and, and France into the 18th century, whereas the lowlands you know, were cut off much earlier. And um, uh, the, so you have whiskey at a slightly lower class, and then you have below that, you have ale and forms of beer. So drink was, had, had strong class associations. It's, it's only after the 18th century, after the Battle of Culloden, when those ties between the highlands and the continent of Europe get cut off because of being dominated by the Anglosphere, that whiskey becomes a more dominant drink because they don't have access to those imports anymore. Okay, well, that, that makes sense. It's economics, supply and demand and availability. Well, politics, it's the politics that cut yeah. them off. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was trying to find your website today and I'm sad to see that uh, there seems to be a bit of a, you know, like everything in the last 18 months, uh, things go awry. Uh, but I do hope that you'll let us know when it revives again, because I noticed when I looked at it earlier that you offer a lot of classes. Yes, I'm actually, I'm, I'm in the process at the moment of, of creating a new website, which is why I'm I'm very sorry that it's that it's not available at the moment as it as it was. Um, I will I will provide you with the URL when I'm sure that I know where it's going to be. But I offer a number of classes about various aspects of Scottish Highland heritage, kind of starting with an introductory course, and which gives you kind of a broad overview of things. And then I have one that I call Reclaiming the Roots which is kind of an in-depth look at things like, you know, social structure, what are clans and where did cl can, clans come from? And other things that are more uh, around Gallic cosmology, you know, the what notion of the sacred did they have? How was the sacred reflected in the landscape? Uh, what was the nature of the stories and the songs that they, that they told at Cayley's and so on? So it's a Kind of an in-depth overview of, of Highland uh, culture. I have another course which has been quite popular called uh, Radicalizing the Roots in which we talk about the, the impact of empire and coloniality on the Highlands and other aspects of kind of the suppression of Gallic culture and its intersection with empire over the last couple of centuries. And it kind of enters a, a larger dialogue that people are having in many countries right now, including Canada, with the truth and reconciliation of what does colonization mean and how, how do Gales enter that story um, historically? So those have been the most popular core courses, and I'm going to be adding two or three new courses uh, in this coming academic calendar year. Okay, well, I hope you do let us know as soon as it's up and airbound the uh, uh, URL for your website. In the meantime, our viewers can Google your name to find your whole bibliography, including these two books that I'll try to show on the screen. Uh, and I'll remind our viewers that in Centre Wellington, we're blessed with three independent bookstores. And I'm sure that they can order the books for people, and I know that the Metropolitan Toronto Library, our big city neighbor, uh, has a few of the main stock that you can reserve and read at your leisure. 
Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to learn about your courses and I hope you'll, uh, oh, look at that. Can I, can I also mention this book? This is the, the first ever anthology of Scottish Gaelic literature composed in Canada. And this is, uh, I think it's over 500 pages long. So there is, yes, it's 550 pages long or something like that. And there's a great deal of material from Ontario in here. Okay, so, wonderful. Um, it's called the Shenachi Nicolia Memory Keeper of the Forest. Okay, that's great. Well, Michael, this has been edifying. I uh, would say, oh my goodness, <laughs> in the <laughs> English. But I'm wondering um, if, if you'd like to close with another favorite saying to wish us well when we all get to meet again when we go live uh, in 2022. Well, there's one of the, of course, the favorite things that Highlanders did was drink to each other's good health. Jock um, which is the Gallic term for a drink to your health. And at the, at the end of a long night of a Kaylee of visiting your neighbors, they would offer a, a drink of health to each other. And in fact, it was the wife's way of saying, hey, it's time to get them out. So it's time for the for the Jach and Dorish. So the Jach and Dorish means literally the, the drink of the door, the doorway, because oh, you're saying, you know, that's have a drink and go away. Head. Oh, honey, look at the time. Yes, <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. That's that's great. Well, Michael, thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge with us. And uh, Again, I urge people to pick up the books through their independent bookstore and to Google uh, Dr. Michael Newton and his uh, big bibliography of works of Scotland and of Scottish settlers in North America. Thank you so much. Top of